I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Take your Bibles. We're going to start. We're going to be in two places today. We're going to start in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, and then we're going to move and look back into the book of Genesis. So you're going to kind of have to be in both places today. We'll start in Hebrews, and then we'll turn to Genesis. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I got the, the opportunity to, to take a, like a personal kind of uh, retreat. I like to do this every once in a while. I got to go up to, I many of you know Glenn Larson, I got to go up to his cabin on the Gunflint Trail, way up on the Canadian border, and, and just spend four or five days there just by myself, just me, my Bible, some books, God, and my dog, um, and, and just had a great time enjoying it. Um, everybody says, well, did you fish? I'm not much of a fisherman. I like to go when people with people, but and I don't own a boat. In fact, I don't even own a fishing rod. Um, but I do like to go when people like to go, and it's always fun. But I didn't really do any fishing. Did a lot of hiking. And, and actually, one of my, you know, we all have these little bucket lists. One of my things on my bucket list is I always wanted to see a moose in the wild. And I was coming back from Grand Marais one night. It's gone 4th of July to watch fireworks. And pulled up alongside the swamp, and there's this moose just looking at me. I could tell what was going through his brain. Come on, dude, move along. Nothing to see here, you know. But it was cool. I got a picture. It wasn't that great of a picture, but I had a good time. It was a holiday weekend. And so July 4th was on Saturday, and, and fr- uh, Sunday morning I, I got up. And if you ever go to Grand Marais, you've got to go to the world's best donut shop. How many of you have been there? Have you been to the world's? Oh, my goodness. They are the best donuts. They have my favorite donut in the world. In New Jersey, we called it a Boston cream. Here they call it a custard Bismarck. But up there they have a Bismarck with chocolate on top that is filled with banana cream. My tongue beat my brain up trying to get it down my throat. I mean, it was just, I, I always get two when I go. So I, I enjoyed that. So I did that Sunday morning. I went to church with Glenn and Renee Sunday morning. And then I, I knew it was a holiday weekend. And I've seen 35 on regular weekends coming from the north to the south. And this was July 4th weekend. So I was like, well, I said, Glenn, I really don't want to go down 35. There's got to be a better way. When I get to Duluth, there's got to be a better way to get home. And he says, oh, yes, you've got to go on Highway 23. It's, it's just a it, you know, lot less traffic, and it's just a beautiful drive. And I happened to call Nate because Nate had spoken that day in church, checked on how things went in church, and he said everybody got up and walked out. So I was a little bit, I didn't understand that. But, but, um, but he said, oh, it's Highway 23. He says, you've got to stop along the way. There's these incredible overpasses where you can just look and see these valleys and everything. I said, all right, that's my kind of thing. I don't have a real time frame to get home. My family's in Florida, so it's not like I really got a rush, you know, and it's not football season, so there's nothing for me. So I took my time. So I headed down 23, and at first I'm driving, and I'm thinking, this is great. This is beautiful. And I did stop at some of those overpasses, and I saw the big valleys and the trees and all the things. It was beautiful. And I, I continued on a little way, and then all of a sudden, there was this sign that came up that said, the bridge is out ahead. And I thought, oh, no. But there were detour signs. And, you know, I grew up in an area where everything's so close together that a detour just means go five feet this way, five feet that way, and you're back. Yeah, you're from Minnesota, so you know. So I start on this detour. And this thing is taking me, I mean, I don't know where I am. I'm going through hunting preserves. I'm, I'm waiting for banjo music, you know. I mean, I'm just scared. And the GPS goes out, so I don't know where I am. And on the one side of the road, there's these big, beautiful houses with these beautiful manicured yards. And on the other side, there's a trailer with three pickup trucks broken down. And I'm where am I? And finally, I got on the shore and I said, you know what? I'm just going this way till I hit something I know. And so I traveled on this road for quite a while thinking, I may have made a huge mistake not following the detour. (laughs) Finally, though, I hit Highway 61 just north of Moose Lake. I didn't even know there was such a place as Moose Lake, and there were no moose there. I was pretty upset. But I got on 61 heading south, found out that Pine County is huge. But I made it home safely. Now, I shared that to to, to get you thinking about this. How many of you know that walking by faith is a journey like that? You know, I mean, think about it. This is why faith is so important in our journey, because in life, you don't always know where you're going. Sometimes there are detours in life. Sometimes there are roadblocks along the way. Sometimes there are surprise accidents. 
Sometimes you get stuck. Sometimes there are rest stops. There's wondrous beauty to see. But sometimes there's wrong turns. And, and if that's what our journey is like, then you know what? We need faith to keep us going. But here's the good news. One day, when that journey's through, we will all eventually, truly be home with Jesus. But that's what the journey of life is, is like. And my pastor used to say this, faith is knowing the unknowable, being certain in uncertainty, seeing what can't be seen, and being sure about what you have hoped for. And that's very similar to the definition we find in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, that says this, these words, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And today we're going to look at a man in the Bible in our series on faith who is probably the greatest example of faith in the Bible, and of course his name is Abraham. His faith is so celebrated that in the Old Testament, in the Levitical prayer of confession, they actually said these words. They said that God found Abraham's heart faithful before him and made a covenant with him. In the New Testament, Abraham is held up as the example of faith for all of us. In fact, the Bible says he believed God. The Bible says that faith was counted in his righteousness. It says that, listen to this, only time in the Scripture you find these words, Abraham is called the friend of God. Now, how would you like to have that on your epitaph? He was the friend of God. And all these things are to teach us that Abraham was a man of faith. And so I'm going to read from Hebrews 11. In fact, look at Galatians 6. We'll get there in a few moments. But in Hebrews 11, I'm going to read to you some verses, and then we're going to eventually skip back to the book of Genesis. Hebrews 11 says this. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. See, he didn't have a GPS either. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a forest land, foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to that city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, were born descendants, as many as the stars of heaven, and as many as the innumerable grains of the sand by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised for, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He has prepared for them a city. By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac your offspring shall be named. He considered, now listen to this, that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. You know, there are really only two ways to live this life. We live by what we see, or we live by what we do not see, and that is the life of faith. And the Christian way is the life of faith. See, we've never seen God. None of us have. We've not seen Christ. Uh, we've not seen heaven or hell. We've not seen the Holy Spirit. No one has. And we've never seen anyone who wrote the Bible. And yet, in spite of all those things, we who claim the name of Christ have staked our eternity and this life as well on this heavenly destination. Abraham is God's pattern of faith. We see him in Scripture. He's, the Bible says he's the father of everyone who believes. This is Galatians chapter 3. This is what it says about Abraham. Just as Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And so Abraham becomes the father of all those who believe. And we see Abraham's faith through action, through his obedience. Everything, no matter what God called him to do, Abraham obeyed God. I, I came across this statement this, this week. I thought it was good. I want you to read it with me because it's, it's worth your reading and knowing. Read with me. Ready? It says this. Faith is not believing in spite of evidence. 
faith is obeying in spite of consequence. Now think about that for a minute. It's not believing because we've seen it's true, because we've seen tangible facts. No, it's obeying what God says in spite of what may happen. And so what I want to do today is just quickly look at three events in the life of Abraham. They're found in Hebrews 11, but we're going to look at the actual original passages in Genesis. And and then principles that we can learn from each of them. And as we think about Abraham today, I want you to know this. The one principle about Abraham's faith that stands out more than anything else is this. It is his obedience to God. And so the truth is this. True faith obeys God. True faith obeys God. Considering Abraham, we learn that true faith obeys God. Listen to this. Even when we don't know all the facts. True faith obeys God even when we don't know all the facts. Genesis chapter 12. I'm going to look at the first couple of verses. Listen to what the Bible says. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And in him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And listen to what this says in verse 4. So Abraham went as the Lord told him. So here's what's happening. God says to Abraham, leave your country, leave your people, leave your family, and go to a place that I will show you. Now, what do you think Abraham's first question to God was? Okay, where do you want me to go? And God says, you don't need to know. I'm not going to tell you. Just start walking and I'll tell you where you should stop. Now, how many of you would go on that kind of a trail? (laughs) I mean, that's pretty tough. God says, Abraham, I just want you to go. I mean, that, that plan that God had for Abraham, that would really cause some fears in our lives, wouldn't it? I mean, think about it. To walk away from my home that I've worked so hard to establish, to abandon my career and, and, and all the trappings that come along with that, all the things I've, be, I've learned to trust in and all the things that give me my identity and who I am, to leave my family and my support structure where I feel secure, to, to let go of all the things that I've built up and, and, and I want to fall back on someday if I need. To start off on a cross-country trip with no map, no GPS, and no destination. Now, I don't know about you. I, I like little trips like that. I do like to just go drive. Several times when, before Wayne got his license back, Wayne would call me up and say, I just got to get out in the country. Can you take me for a ride? I'd say, sure. And we'd get in my van and we'd just drive. And, and the truth is, Wayne could have just left me on the side of the road somewhere because I had no idea where I was. He would just say, turn here, turn left here, turn right there. Um, Wayne, you know there's water right ahead, right? And there's no bridge. We should probably turn around. Um, I mean, that's, that's, I like things like that. But my wife is funny because when, when we go somewhere, she wants to know where we're going, how are we going to get there. And by the way, we better take the interstate, not the country roads, because it gets there faster. And so God calls Abraham to this incredible journey. He says, go, and I'm not going to tell you where you're going. Just keep walking. This is a plan that was not for the faint-hearted. So how could Abraham do it? How could Abraham take off even though we didn't know all the facts? You know, Abraham obeyed God one day at a time and one step at a time. He obeyed God one day at a time, one step at a time. Although God holds up Abraham as this example of faith, we do have to understand that in a lot of ways, Abraham is no different than the rest of us. Abraham had some issues. In fact, Abraham was a a pagan worshiper of a false god. Abraham lived in this city where they worshiped the moon. And the only reason that Abraham takes off on this journey is because God touched his heart, because God called him. And what separates him, though, from many of us is that when God called he responded. I mean, when God called him, when God spoke, he listened. When God promised, he trusted. When God spoke to Abraham, he obeyed. I mean, he just did what God said. Now, it doesn't mean that Abraham didn't make mistakes. Please understand that. Abraham made some mistakes along the way. Living a life of faith does not mean you won't mess up. Sometimes we're going to mess up. Sometimes we're going to falter. But what it does mean is that even when he faltered, he always came back to his trust in the character and the goodness of God and in God's promise of what he had promised him. He always came back to that. So 
how can we do this consistently? How can we continue to come back to God? We do it every day. Abraham shows us. I think Abraham probably believed, although these words weren't written yet, I think Abraham believed like David that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and that the Lord directs his way. I think he believed that God's word was a lamp unto his feet and a light unto his path. He trusted God to lead the way. And you know what? God never once failed him. When we trust God to lead, God has a way of not failing. God has a way of always coming through. When we fail is when we take the reins, is when we try to do things our way. When we try to make things work the way we want them to work, that's when things go awry. So Abraham obeyed God one day at a time, one step at a time. When we live by faith, we do risk openly. Now, if we live our lives in fear, you know what we want if we live our lives in fear? We seek security. We seek ease. We seek a life that has no troubles. That's what fear causes us to do because we don't want to live that way. But when we live a life of faith, we learn that faith takes risk. Let me, let me give you a couple examples from the Scripture. First is Esther. And, and think about the story of Esther we learn that living by faith in the story of Esther doesn't mean just sitting down and enjoying a comfortable feeling, thinking beautiful thoughts. But what it means is facing an impossible situation and trusting in God and not living out fear, but trusting in God no matter what will happen because we're going to obey God's will. And here's what Esther, Esther's asked to go in front of the king. And she has asked to go in front of the king without being called, which at that time could cost you your life. And Esther goes, and she's asked to help save the Jews, and she says this. She says, Go, gather all the Jews to be found in Susa, and hold a fast on my behalf, and do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I am a young, I and my young woman will also fast as you do. And this is what she says. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And here's her words. And if I perish, I perish. Or how about Daniel? Daniel and his three friends. I love these guys. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I love those names. These three men, they knew what it was to live by faith. They're standing, they're in this country, Babylon, and they're commanded to worship this false idol. And you've probably heard the story. And they refused to do it. They would not bow down. And Nebuchadnezzar must have really liked them because they didn't bow down the first time and Nebuchadnezzar gave them a second chance to try. And this is what they say. Listen to this. They replied and said, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your king, O O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image which you have set up. I mean, they knew what it was to walk by faith. I I heard one preacher preach on that text, uh, Daniel chapter 3, and he said they wouldn't bow, they wouldn't bend, and they wouldn't burn. That was a pretty good outline for the text. They just knew what it was to walk by faith. They knew that faith obeyed, and faith risks. But here's the amazing thing. We talk about faith risking and things being done by faith. You have to trust God, and sometimes things don't make sense financially. Things may not make sense uh, Logistically, things may not make sense even sometimes in other ways. But we trust. But here's the great thing. Although we may call it a risk, you know what the truth of the matter is? The safest place in the universe is in the center of God's will. We may call it a risk. People may say, oh, you're risking everything. But when we follow God, God says, I have your back. I will take care of you. We can live by faith because we know wherever we go, God's with us. I love this verse. I'm going to show you here in Joshua 1.9. Josh, God tells Joshua, or Moses tells Joshua, Have not I commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed. And here's why. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Abraham believed God, and he was willing to go on this journey of faith, even though he didn't know all the facts. Even though he didn't have a PowerPoint that laid out everything. Even though he didn't have an Excel document with everything written out and every. God called and Abraham obeyed, even though he didn't know all the facts. Secondly, true faith obeys even when we have to wait, 
Turn over just a page to Genesis chapter 15. Even when we have to wait. Listen to these verses, Genesis 15. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars if you're able to number them. Then he said to them, So shall your offspring be. Listen to this verse. And he believed the Lord. And he counted it to him as righteousness. You know, in Hebrews chapter 11, in that passage, I read from the ESV, it talks about the faith of Sarah. In the NIV, it actually uses Abraham again. But the original Greek actually has the name Sarah in it. And I think that's fascinating. And here's why. Um, I think it's fascinating that Abraham and Sarah are brought together in this. Because the truth is, marriage, a Christian marriage, a marriage that is to honor God, is is a relationship that takes faith. It takes faith to bring two people from totally different backgrounds together and expect it's going to work out. You've got to really trust God. And, and, and I think about this. Just the other day, this, was a, this tickled me. Before Janine got home, I was meeting with somebody, and um, they said to me, this is kind of odd seeing you without Janine, because you guys are just like peanut butter and jelly. And I thought, oh, that's cool. I'm going to use that. So I was talking to Janine that night. I said, Janine, I miss you so much. I feel so naked without you. You're like the jelly to my peanut butter. And I expected her to say, oh, that's so sweet. Do you know what she said to me? Why can't I be the peanut butter? (laughs) It's like, you've got to be kidding me. I just can't get a break here. But the truth is, you know what? As we walk together in marriage, we need to have faith. And so Abraham and Sarah, they've been promised this son. And, and years have elapsed. Fifteen years have elapsed since the, they were promised this son. And, and Abraham and Sarah, they're getting anxious. They're thinking, okay, maybe, maybe we misheard God. Maybe we, I don't know, maybe God's not going to fulfill this promise. They weren't exactly sure what to do. And so, you know what, like we all do, they started planning. They started manipulating, thinking, okay, I can figure this out. There's got to be a way I can help God out with this. Can I just stop and say this? God doesn't need our help. God is perfectly well equipped to handle this world and to handle our lives. He really doesn't need our help. We need to trust Him. And so they're trying to figure out a way they can help God out. But God, in His grace, eventually restates His promise. And He gives Abraham this beautiful picture of what his future is going to look like, about what this son will be like in this promise. He renews his covenant with him. And in an act of faith, Abraham lets go of his worry and he trusts God. He places hope in what God is promising. And even though it doesn't make a lot of sense, Abraham replaces his worry with hope in who God is. And they, this couple, waits for God in faith. Now, how they do that? They waited for God in faith because their faith was in the power of God. It was not in their own power. It was not in what they could do. I mean, let's just face it. Abraham and Sarah were in their 90s. Folks, they were well beyond childbearing years. They were in their 90s. They had come to the place where it was humanly impossible for them to have children. And yet, they weighed that out. The the physical impossibility of being able to have children, they weighed that out against the true impossibility. The true impossibility was that God cannot ever break His promises. God cannot ever break His Word. And so when they thought about that, they put their faith in God's Word, in God's promise, because they knew God doesn't break His promises. Even when you're going to be a parent in your 90s, they knew that God could. And the truth is, every need we have in our lives, God can meet, but we have to trust Him. Here's what Jesus said. He said, if you can, all things are possible for the one who believes. Ephesians 3.20 is a verse that just comforts me. It says, Now to him who is able to do 
far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us. He trusted in God's power. He also, they also trusted in God's promises. And you know what's amazing? The miracle is not so much that they had one child. The miracle is that their children they had were innumerable. That through that one child, God brought about this incredible nation. God gave him the descendants he'd promised. The descendants that would be more than the sands of the seashore, more than the stars of heaven. Because they judged that God was faithful to keep his promises. And here's the thing. You know, it's not only the promises that God made to Abraham that God keeps, but God keeps every promise he's ever made. Here's what the scripture says. For all the promises of God find their yes in Christ. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen for his glory. If we're going to build a life of faith, we have got to trust in God's power. We've got to claim God's promises because God keeps his promise. Now, thinking about them waiting and trusting in the power and promises of God, understand this. Waiting on God, none of us like it. But waiting on God is an important part of growing our faith. You see, we don't just walk by faith, we wait by faith too. I believe it was Charles Spurgeon who said, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, but so are his stops. There's some truth in that. Think about it. David waited 13 years before he became king like God had promised. Noah had to endure ridicule for 100 years while he built a boat in a land that had no water. Joseph had to wait in a pit, and then he had to wait in a prison before God made him the prince of Egypt. Paul had to learn to live with his infirmity, and God didn't heal him. And Abraham and Sarah waited for 15 years for their promised son. Now, how many of you have parents have said this to your kids? Maybe you're out in the yard working. Have you ever asked your kids to do something, and they don't get started right away, and they just... All kids have the same kind of quizzical look on their face. They just go, they look at what needs to be done. And what do we say to them? Don't just stand there, do something. How many of you said that before? Yes, my mother has said that to me quite a few times. In fact, I think my wife has said that to me a few times as well. And so we understand that. We said, don't just stand there, do something. Well, let me just say this. Sometimes God says to his children, Don't just do something. Stand there. Wait. Psalm 37. I'll put it on the screens for you. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Fret not. And folks, what we need to do is not waste the time that God tells us to wait. We need to use that time to reflect on what God is going to do, to reflect on what God has done, to trust Him, to learn more about Him. Getting Running ahead of God never works out well. I've learned that in life. We need to make sure we use the time God gives us. When I go into a hospital to visit people, I almost always invariably say the same thing. And one of the things I say is this. Listen, don't waste this time. Use the time to reflect on God's goodness and what He's done. Ask God questions. God, what do you want me to learn through this? Why am I waiting here? Because sometimes God just puts us down. This winter, I had pneumonia, and I had, to be, I had to do nothing for a week. If you don't know, that's hard for my personality to do. And I had to sit and not do the things I loved. But God had a plan. And God used it. And God used a lot of those things at that time to really bring our church together in a lot of unique ways. But we need to ask God, don't waste the time that God asks you to wait. Because faith obeys God even when we have to wait. And then lastly... True faith obeys God even when we're called to sacrifice what we love. Turn over to Genesis 22. Genesis 22 says this. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Now, if you're familiar with the Bible, you're probably familiar with the story of Abraham, God calling Abraham to 
to give him his only son, Isaac. And as a parent, when I read this passage, God calling Abraham to sacrifice and offer his son is unbelievable to me unless I understand this. God did not want Abraham's son. God wanted Abraham's heart. That's what you need to understand about this passage. God didn't want his son. God wanted his heart. You see, Abraham named his son Isaac, which means laughter. Because, I mean, 100-year-old guy having a kid, that's pretty funny. I mean, that could make it onto the tabloids, you know, the National Enquirer. But it was true. And Isaac begins to grow up. And Abraham looks at him and he thinks, that's the future. I mean, long before Whitney Houston, he thought, I believe the children are our future. No, that's a bad joke anyway. But that's my future. All the promises of God are going to come through Isaac. But could you imagine the pride he felt as he looked and he said, God's going to bring all that he said right through Isaac. And then imagine how his heart sunk as God said, now, take your son, your only son, who you love, and offer him to me on the place that I will show you. And, you know, we're told in Genesis that God was testing Abraham. But, folks, you know, God didn't tell Abraham he was testing him. God just said, do this. Now, as I read this passage, what God was asking him to do is to sacrifice his future. He was asking him to trust him. And I don't believe for a second that God ever intended for Abraham to actually take Isaac's life. I have a suspicion, knowing the character of God that God was going to use this situation to teach Abraham either way. If Abraham went through with it like he did, God was going to teach him something beautiful. God was going to save Isaac. God was going to provide a lamb. God was going to do this incredible thing. But if if Abraham had just said, I can't do it, God, I think God was going to use that in Abraham's life too. Because God not only uses our triumphs, God uses our failures as well. But the lesson here is this. You know, God often calls us to go through great difficulty and suffering before he truly establishes us and uses us. God was going to use Abraham to establish his nation. And God was going to use him. Here's what 1 Peter 5.10 says, a verse that you should be acquainted with, you should underline in your Bible. God says, After you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you after you've suffered a little while. See, the proof of Abraham's faith was that he was willing to give everything to God. He was not willing to hold anything back. He was willing to give everything, even the thing he loved most. And here's here's the principle for us. A faith that can't be tested can't be trusted. Faith gets tested. God did it in His Word. God does it in our lives. Faith gets tested. And here's the thing. When God tests our faith, He never announces it either. He always gives us pop quizzes. There's no schedule like, okay, you better be ready because I'm going to give you a test on Tuesday. doesn't happen that way. But you know what happens in those tests? We find out whether or not our faith is true, whether or not our faith is false whether we're resting in God's power and promises or resting on our own power and our own promises and our own ability to get things done. Abraham focused on God's covenant promises and he trusted that God would work these things out all for his own glory. And yes, God's going to test us. God tests us all kinds of ways. We need to trust him like Abraham did. Now let me make a couple applications and we're done. First of all, Where's God calling you on your journey of faith? I mean, are you being held back by your fears? Do we sometimes resist God because we know it involves maybe losing or risking something that we're really secure in? I can't do this because of this. See, we're so good at planning everything out. God says, just trust me. Has God asked you to do something that seems scary? Sometimes that's what God does. Sometimes God asks us to do things that make no sense whatsoever. I remember when I became principal of the Christian school in Florida, 
I was a youth pastor there, and I became pr- principal for one year. And I remember talking to my friend Brad Raby on the phone, telling him kind of what was going on. And I told him, this is what's happening. I'm doing this. And they asked me to be principal. And I don't know why, but I really believe God's asking me to do this. And this is what he said to me. Another guy in youth ministry, so encouraging to me. He looked at me. He talked to me on the phone. He said, are you nuts? You're crazy. I said, well, that's kind of beside the point. He said, but I really believe God called me to do this. And I think we can agree. God called me to do that. God did some great things there. Let me remind you, the safest place in the world, in the universe, is in the center of God's will, regardless of whether it makes sense or not. Regardless of whether we have to risk or not. Second application, how will you use the times that God calls you to wait? Instead of worrying about the future, we ought to turn our worry into hope by placing our faith in God. You know, God says in Ecclesiastes 3.11 that He will make everything happen at the right time. God's calendar may not be the same as ours, but God knows how to fulfill His promises. So don't waste the time. And then lastly, has God called you to a pop quiz in your faith? I mean, think about this. Think about Abraham for a minute. If you were asked, or if I were asked, to let go of the very thing on which you have staked your entire future, would you let it go? Would you be willing to open your hands and say, God, here? Or would you, like we do so many times, just hold on and say, I can't, not that. You can't have that, God. I'm counting on that. I need that. You see, we need to just let God have His way. Whether it's our bank account, our job title, our achievements, our awards, our image, our place of status in the community, whatever it might be, we need to release it to God and trust Him. Because He'll do exactly what He says He'll do. So Abraham is still the model of faith for the child of God. And every one of us should build a faith and a life of faith like he did. See, Abraham's faith obeyed God's will even when he didn't understand, even when it didn't make sense, even though he didn't know all the facts. He left his home. Abraham's faith believed God even though he didn't see. He trusted in Isaac that God could raise him from the dead. And you know what? God will do exactly what He promises He'll do, just like He did in the life of Abraham.